A Republican from the Midwest, Lawrence E. King, is serving a 15-year prison sentence for a multi-million dollar fraud. But financial crime is only half the story. This is the true story of Lawrence King. It is the story of an evil at the heart of America, of a cover-up at the highest level. One man is attempting to uncover the full story. John DeCamp is among the most highly decorated Vietnam veterans. A former Republican state senator in Lincoln, Nebraska, he is now a lawyer fighting the legacy of Lawrence King's evil network. It's a web of intrigue that starts in our holy of holies, Boys Town, Nebraska, one of the most respected institutions in the United States, and spreads out like a spider web to Washington, D.C., right up to the steps of the nation's capital, the steps of the White House, involves some of the most respected and powerful and richest businessmen in this United States of America. And the centerpiece of the entire web is the use of children for sex and drug dealing and drug couriers, the compromising of politicians, the compromising of businessmen, but worst of all, the corruption of key institutions of government that have the duty and responsibility to make sure these things never happen. World-famed Boys Town is in the news again. Made famous by an Oscar-winning film, Boys Town, Nebraska is America's favorite children's charity. It was founded in 1917 by Father Edward Flanagan. spectacle in our social life is an neglected, unwanted, and unloved boy who has become a serious problem in our society. Boys Town was started to uh, be a home for orphans. That was after World War I. And uh, since then, society has changed and the problems of boys have changed. And so now, uh, it's a question of taking care of uh, homeless, uh, abandoned, neglected, uh, abused boys, and now girls also. With cash reserves of $500 million, Boys Town is the richest square mile in the world. It has been granted the privileges of an incorporated town, a Catholic diocese, and a school district for 500 boys and girls. One third of its annual income is raised from public donations, solicited by begging letters and promotional videos. I'm Father Val Peter, the caretaker of Father Flanagan's dream, and the executive director of Boys Town. Does Boys Town really exist, people ask me? You bet it does. Located in the heartland of America, Boys Town youth have come from many backgrounds and locales. As they graduate, they shall seek new adventures and head for different places. But always, they shall carry with them the spirit of Boys Town. If you to help Boys Town, send your tax-deductible gift to Father Val Peter, Boys Town, Nebraska, 68010. Boys Town, for me, was the first thing I ever heard of when you think of institutions that you respect. Believe it or not, I was there for a while when I was a young boy. Probably worldwide, there's no institution other than Boys Town that has done so much good for so many children over such a long period of time, so successfully. When an institution like that gets contaminated, purposes of abusing children, instead of protecting children, then you better, if you got any decency at all, uh, do something about it or, or at least get it cleared up. John DeCamp lays the blame for the contamination of Boys Town on the one-time leader of the National Black Republican Council, Larry King. Larry King was the fastest rising black star in the entire Republican Party of the United States during all of the 1980s. And he was also one of the most evil individuals in this country in terms of being a dealer of children, in terms of being a thief, 40 million that they documented he stole, and in terms of using and compromising and corrupting one after another politicians. The base for his network was a small people's bank in Omaha, Nebraska, the Franklin Federal Credit Union. 
Larry King was its general manager. Thank you. This is especially an exciting day for me. Mr. King was a very charismatic person. When he came to the credit union, he was brought in because the credit union was actually failing. He did everything to build the credit union. King courted the leaders of Omaha's wealthy business district. Banks, industry, and charities placed millions of dollars in King's hands. From 1979, Larry King developed close commercial ties to Boys Town, and Boys Town youngsters were sent to work for his companies. Boys Town had quite a few accounts at Franklin Credit Union. Those were considered very valuable accounts. They were handled exclusively by the bookkeeping department. But on the average of once a month or once every two months, we always seem to incorporate a person from Boys Town. King used Boys Town as a source of young boys for his business and for sex and drug orgies. Paul Banassi was a victim of King's abuse. He was also sent by King to lure Boys Town youngsters off campus. We used to just drive around and go up toward a home. That's when we used to do some of the uh, scavenger hunts with picking up some of the kids. You know, just kind of win their confidence, become friends with them for a while. Start inviting them to the parties. The kids were 10 years old or older. In 1986, King's plundering of Boys Town was reported by staff to the chief executive, Father Val Peter. Subsequent testimony proves that he carried out his own investigation, but that King's victims refused to talk. Nebraska has a very clear statute that child abuse allegations should be reported to authorities. They shouldn't be reported to the principal of the school, the director of a facility. They should be reported directly to either Child Protective Services or law enforcement. An internal investigation. Uh, at Boys Town would have no status. I mean, in other words, that evidence collected may be something that could augment, but it certainly could not take the place of an investigation, a criminal investigation. Could you understand why a very detailed report from a social worker employed at Boys Town identifying children and identifying their alleged abusers never saw the light of day? Nothing happened with that. No, I couldn't understand that because I've I known that had been I wouldn't put up with that, but uh, is that is something like that happened? I don't know. Well, in retrospect, I uh, regret having any association with uh, uh, Larry King. Uh, had I known it at the time, it would never have happened. Despite the investigation, Larry King remained free to feed his pedophilic parties with child victims. But in 1988, a routine review brought the Boys Town cases to the attention of Nebraska's State Foster Care Review Board. And the information presented to the Foster Care Review Board, either via the telephone reports, the personal reports, or the reports we reviewed, uh, Larry King's name was consistently present as someone that the youth were making allegations against. I mean, I turned that information over to authorities. and. Nothing happened. I would say we handed over at least a foot high um, amount of material. Generally speaking, uh, the allegations were ignored. Omaha police now accept that Larry King may have been abusing children. Good morning, Roberta. Good morning, King. But its most senior detective claims he never received any evidence. It is certainly possible that Mr. King was involved in illegal acts with children. If there was sufficient evidence, evidence of those types of allegations, he would have been prosecuted by the county attorney's office. For me, it was very clear that the case was not investigated and not pursued because of the alleged perpetrators. Those perpetrators named by the children formed a ring of rich and powerful pedophiles in Omaha. Men from industry, politics, the media, even the police. Besides Larry King, Ringleaders were department store billionaire Alan Bear, and the celebrity columnist of the Omaha World Herald newspaper, Peter Citron. 
With the judicial system apparently paralyzed, Larry King's political and business empire grew. He courted the Republican Party nationally and plundered Franklin's accounts to finance a luxury lifestyle of limousines, private planes, and palatial homes, three in Omaha and one in Washington, D.C. Franklin's records show he spent $10 million on jewelry, flowers, and private planes. And his lavish spending bought him a charmed life. Larry King was constantly heralded, cheered, applauded in the news media as the great businessman that's helping the poor people, the black community of Omaha. But King's extravagance attracted the attention of the Internal Revenue Service. As a result, on April the 11th, 1988, the Franklin Credit Union was raided and closed by the FBI. King was arrested, and a federal investigation showed he'd stolen $40 million from Franklin. But the FBI's inquiries were secret, and evidence of King's sex ring was quickly covered up. In November 1988, Nebraska's state government set up a parallel investigation into the Franklin financial collapse. A legislative committee was formed. Its chairman was the Republican head of Nebraska's banking committee, corn farmer and state senator Lauren Schmidt. But the money trail led quickly to the original allegations of child abuse and almost immediately anonymous threats began. I received a phone call on the floor of the legislature. The caller did not identify himself, but he said, Lauren, you do not want to have an investigation of the Franklin Federal Credit Union. And I asked who I was speaking to, and they said, that doesn't matter, uh, but you shouldn't have that investigation. And I said, well, why not? He said, it will reach to the highest levels of the Republican Party. And we're both good Republicans. The night before we testified before the uh, legislative committee, I did receive a phone call at home that said, if you speak, you won't live to regret it. Undeterred, Schmidt's committee hired professional investigators Karen Ormiston and Gary Caradori. When we hired Mr. Caradori, uh, I was very specific to him. I said, uh, we do not want you to bring to the committee rumors, uh, innuendos, nothing that cannot be backed up with facts. I said, bring to the committee that which we can take to a prosecutor. On the streets of Omaha, Gary Caradori and Karen Ormiston found new victims of King's pedophile network. Every new youngster told the same stories as those from Boys Town, covered up three years earlier. They were telling us about prominent people in Omaha and elsewhere that were abusing children at, uh, at parties. The prominent citizens' uh, names um, that originally came up uh, were uh, of concern to me because I knew many of those individuals and uh, I very frankly was shocked to have those names show up on the list. Ormiston and Caradori recorded their new witnesses on videotape. A victim of abuse since he was eight, Paul Bernassi was present at many of Larry King's sex parties. Who were some of these people that would come to these parties? Larry King, King Sipatron, Wilson, Lyle, Mr. Hughes. And those who I'd feel about that, like that people. Media personality Peter Citron procured some of his victims from Boys Town. The kids he liked were mainly around the age of uh, probably about 8 and 13. It was mainly uh, fondly and oral sex with him. He did have some anal sex, but he usually did that with the older kids. But Citron's abuse of Paul Bonassi involved ever more sadistic parties. He and the other guy tied me up and... Okay. 
pretend to be like have some other kids perform sex on the or they okay. me and they burn me some cigarettes. Okay. Just take a deep breath now. Whenever you were tied up, were, was there anybody else present other than uh, you, Peter Sifkin, and Danny King? Yes. Who was that? It was Alan Barris and Kevin, Larry King, Paul Marino, and uh, also Troy Bonner. Troy Bonner would tie you up? Was there. Troy Bonner was 17 when he was introduced to the paedophile parties by Alan Bear. He uh, lifted me up, uh, kind of moved me over the bed, the blister on the bed, and uh, put his head down, started performing oral sex on me while his penis was at my end. Uh, as they say, a 69 possession. Yeah. Alan Bear was a sick fuck. Didn't care, you know, wanted sex, nasty, you know, I don't even know if you can call it sex, you know, and um, take it any way he can get it, pay for it, he liked to, but if he had to take it by force, he would. Larry King was the same kind of sick fuck Alan Bear was, except Larry King was more violent, uh, more sure of himself, you know. I mean, I would, you know, see him fuck a 10-year-old boy in the ass, you know, and, until he bled and, you know, just pull out and stop and, you know, push him down, you know, and, you know, and then go out and, you know, meet with decent people. King would also provide underage girls for abuse. Alicia Rowan was 15 when she attended her first party. And met some guys there that were from both to and it was at that party that I met Larry King. At the time that I met Larry King, I did not know that he was Larry King. I, I had met him. It was the first time I'd ever met him. Alan Bear and Larry King frequently hosted the child sex parties in penthouse apartments at the Twin Towers luxury block. Um, a lot of it was... Um, me handcuffed with my hands behind my head um, and my feet tied and then doing different things. Um, what do you mean? Uh, sometimes there'd be a guy straddling over my face. Okay. Most of the time, Larry King took pictures quite a bit during that time. I know it's difficult. I don't know. Okay. And I think I could have said no. Okay. But I don't know. Okay. And you know, Alicia, you're a victim. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the young age, let's go off camera for a minute. We were appalled. Appalled. It was, it was incredible. It's incredible what these kids went through, I think. I was shocked when I walked in. There was a, a kid, I would say, about 15 years old, out in the middle of the room. Uh, one guy was standing in front of him. He was bent over, and the other guy was, like, reaching under him, playing with his nipples, while a guy whom Jeff told me was a police officer shoving beads up his rectum. The police officer was shoving beads up his rectum? Yes. Everything, I mean, from just, you know, touching to, uh, you know, fruit, squash, you know, huge squash, you know, that big around, you know, stuck into you, into your ass, you know. Uh, heat, heat things, hot things, you know, poked at you and stuck in you, you know. I got those scars on my arm one night at a party where Larry King was, and he had brought somebody, I don't clearly remember who it was, uh, you know, wanted to 
see how strong a man we were or something, you know, and have us push our arms together. And, and you push your arms together. Danny has, King has these same scars. And you push them tight together. And then you light cigarettes. And as soon as you get burning, you just drop them down between your arms and, you know, let it, let it burn. You know, and they made us stand there naked and touch each other by holding our arms together and burn cigarettes. Where, you know, it's on film someplace. I mean, they filmed it, burning, you know. And those of us that didn't like to be involved and didn't want to be involved were threatened. Because... I understand. And who would do these threatening remarks? Larry King. Do you think Larry King personally did? Well, he did, I think he did. And when they threatened, you know, that I can go find somebody that will kill you, and it will kill your family. Um, he didn't tell anybody. Larry King was also here. He came in, and uh, we drank and did cocaine. I didn't do much, and he turned me on to what Larry King did. He didn't like me because, you know, I would, I would get high on drugs, you know, and I would question him about, you know, how can you... You do. I mean, once I asked him, you know, he wanted me to shit on him, urinate on him, you know, and I did, but gladly, you know, I mean, you know, I even said to him, you know, you stupid fucker, you know, I mean, I just shit on you, you're paying me money, how can you get into that, you know, and I, I got, you know, beat up by it, I came home here a lot of times beat the shit from, you know, misspeaking my tongue, so to speak, and, you know, just telling him how I felt sometimes. Drugs was a, a strong part of, uh, how they got control of some of the kids because that's what some of the kids were there to get they would uh do the sexual uh acts and then be provided with uh cocaine or uh, whatever type of drug they wanted heroin you know i don't i don't know but that's was my my drug of choice you know till this day i remain an addict you know larry king was i would say the center of transporting the children around the country. The, the airplanes were usually um, in his name, at least in his name. They were paid for by Larry King. We met them in Pasadena. Met who in Pasadena? We met Larry King was there. There was um, three boys that I had seen at one of the receptions at the country Cafe were there. And I'm almost positive they were boys, ten boys. Almost positive. Um, they were there. You mean graduates of boys, ten? Well, I'm not present. I think they were present because they were young. Well, how would they get away for a long time? I have no idea. Okay. Boys Town uh, came up frequently during the investigation, but we found it very difficult to get information about Boys Town. I was not able to find any information on my visit there, and. Uh, Mr. Caridori could not get information either. Four years on, Boys Town remains unwilling to discuss its involvement with Larry King. We asked for an interview with Chief Executive Father Val Peter, but Boys Town's public affairs officer refused. I would uh, have to give you a flat no. I'm just going to tell you at this point that uh, we will not participate with you. We have no interest in talking to you folks. It's something that we don't even care to delve into. No. Hi. Hi. Is Father Val Peter available, please? Uh, you can check in his office. It's the first one on the screen. Thank you very much. We're here because we have to give Father Val Peter and Boys Town every opportunity to talk to us about the Please very serious the allegations. Please turn your recorder off. Please step outside. Why is it that Boys Town is unwilling Please to discuss your outside. relationship with Larry King? We don't have a relationship with him. I'm afraid papers that we possess show that Boys Town had a relationship with Larry King. I just suggest you be very careful about what you report. Excuse me. So, um, I'll let you leave. By the spring of 1989, so serious were the child abuse allegations before the Franklin Committee that its chairman, Lauren Schmidt, sought the advice of his lawyer, John DeCamp. He told Schmidt to turn over all the evidence to the FBI. 
Immediately, the videotaped testimony was leaked to a hostile media. The media immediately started discrediting the witnesses. They were, um, the witnesses came across in the media, in the Omaha World Herald, especially, as the criminals. The last three victim witnesses were demolished by the press, particularly the Omaha World Herald. The paper never looked for information that would support any of the allegations. The whole purpose of the stories were to, was to destroy any credibility that these youth may have. I've heard that people said that Gary Caridori coached me and uh, that he told me what to say, but the fact was I didn't meet Gary Caridori until way after I'd already talked to the Omaha police about the abuse and had named all the same people. And they didn't ask me very much about Larry King or, Al or, or even uh, Alan Bear at all. They treated the allegations that I made about the, about the people who abused me almost like a joke. The information did not come our way. It was given, as I said, to the FBI and Nebraska State Patrol. They conducted their own investigations of the information. The stories were of such uh, significance that the investigators first wanted to prove the accuracy of the stories. As they said about the investigation of the three, initially three, and then a fourth person were telling the stories, as the investigation developed, it became obvious to the investigators that the information was not accurate, that in fact it was an entire conspiracy of, of allegations, none of which had any truth to them. I was very disappointed with the way uh, the FBI and law enforcement treated the victims. They, in fact, uh, turned them into the offenders, so to speak. And instead of taking the evidence that was delivered to them by the victims and interrogating the persons who the victims identified, uh, they seemed to bear down and try to get the victims to change their story. Troy Bonner was brought in for questioning by the FBI. The FBI's attitude was, you know, just no, that this, these kind of things don't happen. From the first interview when I went, you know, and realized they don't believe a fucking thing I'm saying, you know, I mean, they are, I mean, they, they were just appalled, but I realized what that, that look in their eye was back then, it was fear. It was fear of, every, you know, I mean, I had witnessed, you know, firsthand things that would, you know, destroy this city, you know, people, or a position, you know what I mean? It's not going to be believed, believed, they said. It will not be believed. You will be found guilty of perjury. And you, I mean, they weren't telling me maybe. You know, they were saying, uh-uh, it, there's no way. You're going, you go on with this story, you're going to jail. I mean, that was said to me direct. Just out of fear, I came to recant the story out of fear. Troy Bonner agreed to recant his videotaped testimony and state instead that his evidence had been invented. Next, the FBI used Troy in an attempt to trap Alicia Owen into recanting her evidence about Larry King's ring of powerful pedophiles. The phone call, recorded by the FBI on March the 9th, 1990, proves conclusive evidence for John DeCamp. This is Special Agent Michael F. Mott. The following will be a consensually recorded telephone call between Troy Boner and Alicia Owen. Hello. Hey, what's going on? I'd like to ask you that. <laughs> talk to me. No, you talk to me. I don't understand why you're lying. Why are you lying? What are you talking about? That's what I'm asking you. You're calling me why I'm why I'm lying? Yeah. You can talk to this whole thing, Alicia. You're full of shit. You either tell me what's going on. You're full of shit. Hey, look. Couldn't have listening on the mind. I have nobody listening to me. I'm listening to you and I'm hoping you'd give me some fucking answers. I'll be honest with you, I don't know what kind of game you're playing. I'm not trying to play a game. And I don't know how, who you have on your phone call. You're being stupid, Alicia. I'm not going to go to jail for you. And that's what's going to happen. Why don't you go to jail? Jail for telling the truth? No, jail for lying. What have you lied about? I haven't lied. Okay, but why are... Listen, shut up. Listen to me. You're not out here being talked to them every day. The pressure's kind of hard. You literally 
have to have bricks for brains to take on the FBI in this country. And that's exactly what you'd have to do to do this properly. They now, in my opinion, in my investigation, are the architects of the cover-up. We asked the FBI for an interview about its investigation of the Franklin scandal. Larry Holmquist with the FBI here. We feel it would, it would be inappropriate for us to comment. We worked this with the Omaha Police Department. We just don't feel it would be appropriate for us to make comments. As Gary Caradori and Karen Ormiston sought out new witnesses on the streets of Omaha, they found themselves under constant threat. Gary was threatened several times. His, his vehicles were tampered with. I would think whoever tampered with them, it was a scare tactic because it was so obvious that they were being tampered with. Gary got, he was, there was one piece of evidence I know he got that he was, that he even said he, he got one step ahead of him this time. He told us about this book, it was, it was like addresses, telephone numbers, names. He said if, if, they, uh, if they knew he had it, they'd kill him. On July the 11th, 1990, Gary Caradori and his eight-year-old son, AJ, were flying home from Chicago. They had watched the All-Stars baseball game, and Caradori had been pursuing new leads. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board are in Harold Cameron's cornfield trying to determine what caused this private plane to crash, killing its two occupants. The bodies of Gary Caradori and eight-year-old AJ were found in the wreckage. National Transportation Safety Board investigators say wreckage from the crash is apparently strewn over a three-quarter to one-mile long stretch in this field. The, the fact that the wreckage is scattered over a large area certainly demonstrates that it did break up in flight. The exact mechanism of breakup yet is still unknown. The federal investigation was never able to discover what tore the plane apart. There are things missing from the plane. His briefcase is missing. Um, again, we'll, we'll never know what all was missing because I don't, I don't know what he had with him. I don't know what he did in Chicago. He may have had information he was coming back with. Within 24 hours of the tragedy, FBI agents impounded all records of the investigation. Gary's widow Sandy is still unable to come to terms with her loss. As a mother, I don't want to ever think that somebody murdered my child, let alone my husband. But I think if you'd ever talk to any parent, be it mother or father, who's ever lost a child, I mean, the worst thing that you can think of is that somebody would want to murder a child. I really feel that somebody killed my brother. And uh, inside me, I, I know that somebody killed my brother. If somebody could help us out somewhere, somebody knows something and uh, may, uh, may God help those who did that to him and his family. Gary Caradori's death pricked Troy Bonner's conscience. He promised Sandy that he would recant his recantation and tell the truth. I set the record straight. I was, you know, going to do it. Uh, and would. You know, the truth would come out, you know, and somebody would be ha held accountable for his death. And then at the funeral, I had seen, you know, FBI guys, you know, and they, they looked at me. You know, I was supposed to meet Senator Lovett and Schmidt for lunch after the funeral. And, uh, you know, that's when I decided, I told my mom, you know, we're not going to do the lunch. We're going to hightail it out of Lincoln now. The effect of Gary's crash on the investigation, I think, in effect, put an end to any anybody else coming forward with sensitive information like this. That's when I was finished, because I figured out if they murdered Gary and his son, 
there was nothing that would stop them. There was no, there was no piece of paper, there was nothing we could come up with that was going to get anything done. Under pressure from the FBI, Troy Bonner agreed to tell a Douglas County grand jury investigating Larry King that he and Alicia Owen had concocted the entire child abuse story on payment of a $500 bond. Troy Bonner was to be the star witness against Alicia Owen, but he grew uneasy about maintaining what he claims were the lies fed to him by the FBI. But when his brother Sean died in an inexplicable gun accident, Troy and his family were convinced they'd been sent a warning message. You know, and they, they killed him just flat out right somehow, professionally, made something happen, you know, to shut me up. The purpose of Sean's death, to instill fear, and it worked. Do I feel guilty about my brother? Yes, I do. That's that's where all this is coming from. This is where the energy. That's where the energy is coming from. That I'm getting to do this. Is for him because, I mean, it, it should have been me there instead of him. Really, I mean, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad, but I mean, he he was brilliant and and you know innocent. You know. It, it should have been me. I mean, he had so much to give. I had taken so much. You know, it should have been the other way around. I, I can't explain to you what it feels like to lose a child. But when you see the pain your kids have because of that, it's much worse. I can't do anything for him. I can't take that pain away for him. Lauren Schmidt's legislative committee issued a report denouncing the grand jury. Two months later, it was disbanded, leaving Schmidt a broken man. The message was not lost on most politicians in Nebraska. I think the message that was delivered was if any legislative committee ever tries to conduct a thorough investigation again, the same thing will happen. It has shaken my faith in the institutions of government. I used to be a firm believer that that uh, the system would work, and uh, that people who did things wrong would be punished. And uh, we discovered uh, victims who claimed to have been abused and who the grand jury acknowledged had been abused. But they did not try to find out who had abused those individuals. Instead, um, they convicted Alicia Owen of perjury, indefensible from my point of view. In July 1991, Alicia Owen was convicted of perjury. Her sentence was between 9 and 25 years. I can't find a case in the history of this country where some kid got sentenced to 25 or 30 years in prison for something like this. If you were going to pick a, a what I call a tell sign, something that says something species about the whole thing, it was in the sentencing itself. For some reason, they had to send a signal to every kid who was a potential witness. My opinion again. A signal so loud and clear, if you dare to come forward, if you dare to talk, watch what happens. Three months later, Larry King was jailed for the $40 million fraud. He was given a 15-year sentence, 10 years less than Alicia Owen. John DeCamp is now the only man fighting to help Larry King's victims. He has become the lawyer for Paul Bonassi and Alicia Owen. I live in Nebraska. Hell, I was born here, raised here. I have four kids growing up here. Like it or not, it, it's my heritage, you know. Well, if it's a dirty cesspool that I got to live in or look back on that I left, that ain't good. The real cost, if I were going to say to my family, has been the fear and intimidation that's put in some of the kids. A couple of the kids are really, really frightened and uh, uh, really had some sleeping problems over it, you know, here, this or that. So that, that's been the real concern I've had. 
In the face of mysterious threats, John has turned for advice to his friend and one-time boss, former head of the CIA, Bill Colby. Uh, old Bill Colby told me better than anything. The, the one thing that uh, the bad people can't afford is publicity and, and knocking you off right now or doing something obvious to, to one of your kids uh, would bring them more trouble than it's worth. I said, you have to consider the possibility of some danger to not only your reputation, but to your person. I mean, there are, people do react rather violently to some kinds of charges, or particularly if they're true, there's more apt to be a negative reaction than if they're false. If they're false charges, then they can be reacted to in a normal way, by a libel suit or whatever. But uh, a true, if there's truth in it, there can be a danger in that situation. We've seen that happen in other cases. John DeCamp has arranged to meet Troy Bonner, the young man he sees as the key to the cover-up. He's in great danger. The reason is he carries the secret, so to speak. He served his purpose for the FBI and others by committing the lies that put the seal on the cover-up. His greatest safety probably lies in doing exactly what he knows he should do, that is exposing the whole thing, taking one final last chance and telling the truth. Uh, my fears are that, you know, I'm not going to be believed again. It's just, you know, going to be a whole other kind of exploitation like it was last time. You know, and afraid that that's going to happen or, you know, I might end up dead or a loved one might end up dead again. I want this to go forward and, and have something done so that all those other kids who are a lot worse, more worse things have happened to can come forward and see that action can be taken because there are a lot of other kids out there that, you know, things happen to them that, you know, a lot worse than, hap than happened to me. You have to, if you want to protect yourself and your life and your family's life, both now and particularly in the future is to use the institutions of government that have been set up to protect you and make them work. That means you go into federal court, you go after the people that have done this cover-up, and you expose it so there's no longer any percentage on their part in eliminating you because the secret's out. That's why we're here today, to, 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 to let it out. I have no doubt that he's now telling the truth, number one, and number two, that he originally told the truth. Potentially, they could decide to charge him with perjury because now he is telling that they forced me to lie. I did lie at Alicia's trial. I did lie before the grand jury. I did it because the authorities were forcing me to do it and I was scared for my family. My brother had been killed when I, when I tried to back out the one time. Potentially, they could charge him with perjury this time. Alicia Rowan is out of prison and on bail, while DeCamp appeals against her perjury conviction. As he prepares for a court hearing, new evidence of the cover-up emerges, and once again, it involves Troy Bonner's evidence. The tapes that were shown to the grand jury had been edited. Everything that matched Troy's statement was shown. That matched mine I know it's was raised. edited out. And I think maybe one of the things we want to do is show the judge specifically how where these, you know, little five-minute segments of, look, this tape says this, and then show him it isn't in this tape, and this is the tape the grand jury saw. I'm going to attempt to get these tapes, and we'll see what happens next. But to obtain the evidence, DeCamp must approach some of the very officials he believes were involved in the cover-up, the county attorney's office, which ran the grand jury. In the good old Alicia Owen case, 127-194, I'm trying to get the evidence, the tapes and the tr transcripts of Troy and Danny, Troy, uh, Troy Bonner. It might be downstairs. Can we get that up here once? Yeah. I think there's two tapes. There should be, as I understand, and the transcript of them. But if I can get them, uh, I can start reviewing them and figure out maybe a little bit on what's happening on some things. Look at the county attorneys, they have all the bills up there. Oh. Uh, Robert, uh, let me guess, Robert Siegler has them. 
Robert Siegler is the prosecuting attorney fighting to send Alicia Owen back to prison. After lengthy negotiations, the camp emerges with the tapes the grand jury never saw. Okay, and what airline? Uh, I flew out of American. Okay, and uh, did you go direct? No, I had to go to stop over in Denver. No, it was a stop over in Dallas Fort Worth. So you went from where to where to where? I went from Omaha to Dallas Fort Worth, uh, like an hour, and then uh, a big, big plane from uh, Dallas to Los Angeles. All right, did anybody go with you? Alicia Owen. If this indeed were left out of the grand jury proceedings, then I am totally shocked and, and angry beyond words. Here it is, so to speak, the smoking gun that they could go out and verify, the corroboration. In other words, the linkage to King that was denied. Cover-up. Organized, planned, deliberate cover-up. The courthouse, Wahoo, Nebraska. The hearings begin. Alicia Owen is ready to testify. So too is Paul Bonassi. But there is no sign of Troy Bonner. De Camp discovers that Robert Siegler has sent the young man a threatening subpoena. Fearing arrest for perjury, Troy has gone into hiding. Let's try and subpoena my brother's guy. Is Troy okay? Yeah. yeah, he's okay. I'm just not going to have him testify until after he does. Okay, Troy's not here. Where's Alicia? No. She's in there. In court, the camp successfully pleads for another adjournment. The county attorney's office begins to search for Troy Bonner, but Robert Siegler won't say why. I'll ask you whether you're about to charge Troy Bonner with perjury. Oh, well, thank you. Why isn't the coming, Mr. Siegler? You're a public official, aren't you? Mr. Siegler, is it true you are about to charge Troy Bonner with perjury? No, I am. Mr. Siegel, if you do not charge Troy Bonner with perjury, does that mean you accept his, what he's saying is true? No comment. Why are you trying to have Troy Bonner summoned to this hearing, Mr. Siegel? No comment. Why no comment, Mr. Siegel? No comment. Every victim witness who stepped forward in any way or even was a potential witness that somebody heard about has either been killed, put in jail under some theory or other, terrified or run out of the state, discredited. Every perpetrator, every perpetrator, even the convicted ones, have been treated as conquering heroes. Obviously, the FBI was protecting something a lot more significant than a bunch of old pedophiles having improper relations with little boys. They were protecting something a lot more significant than a bunch of drug peddlers. They were protecting, in my opinion, they were protecting some very prominent politicians, some very powerful and wealthy individuals associated with those politicians and the political system up to and including the highest uh, political people in this entire country. In search of answers, John DeCamp goes to Washington to investigate Larry King's powerful connections in the nation's capital. Paul Bonassi has come too. Larry King threw child sex parties at his $5,000 a month Washington house. Paul Bonassi was one of the victims. Larry King's house down in Washington, D.C. Was, was, was a nice house. It was on what they, I guess, believe it was Embassy Row because 
that's what they kept uh, talking about. There were a lot of flags from different countries when you drove around in the area. So tell me, Paul, how often did you come here? I was about 14, about 1981, and at first it was about three or four times the first year. After that, it was about once a month after 81. And who brought you here? Larry King brought me here. And this is the actual house where you... Yes. And what, you were used for sex there? Yes. Some of the parties, when they started off, were straight political type parties with no sex. And then when some of the men had left, some of the politicians had left, the ones that had planned, they had planned on uh, engaging in some type of sexual activity, uh, that would come after the party. Some of the kids would be held downstairs in some of the rooms where if they acted up or if they started freaking out because of the drugs that they were on, they'd put them in a room that they couldn't get out of and they'd lock them in. Were there drugs at these parties? Yes. What kind of drugs? Anything you wanted. Cocaine, uh, heroin, speedballs. You're uh, telling me those speed. things were at these parties where you had Larry King and prominent politicians? Yes. Were they readily available to anybody at the party? They... At the after parties they were readily available for anybody beforehand they did it more uh, upstairs than they did anywhere else, and it was kind of in the back rooms. Were any attempts ever made that you know of to, uh, to expose this situation? As far as I know, nothing's ever been done, and most of the people that were in there had already been, I guess you say, compromised. King's partner in sex crime was powerful Washington lobbyist Craig Spence. He took youngsters like Benassi on midnight tours of the White House. So you were in the White House then? Yes. And how, how did you gain access? Well, I came down with uh, Larry King, but Craig Spence was the one that arranged the trip for us. And it was kind of a, a gift for our services that we were doing. How many times were you on this kind of a trip? I came to it on two times. Two times? And were you used for sex on those occasions? None until after we left. After you left the White House? Yes. Yeah. What time of night? It was usually around uh, midnight. For me, it was just kind of weird being in the White House at that time of the night, getting to go into places that the guy was telling us that uh, nobody gets to go to. I mean, we've seen, I've seen rooms in there that uh, I'd never even heard about. Craig Spence and Larry King had a couple of groups. One was called Bodies by God, and they had the Cowboys. And there was another group that was started by Larry King, which was called the Golden Boys, which was kids that were usually under the age of approximately 10. On the trail of Craig Spence, DeCamp finds the investigative reporter who exposed Spence's Cowboy network, Paul Rodriguez of the Washington Times. We had uh, uncovered a. Uh a series of allegations from some miners and it led me to a cowboy operation here in Washington. And it sure fits with, you know, this boy Paul Benassi. And he tells a tale of being brought to the to the, the White House on occasion, kind of as a reward for the kid. Craig Spence's dad, he committed suicide. He had advanced stages of AIDS. He was an AIDS carrier and he killed himself. This was the thing that always bothered me. They claimed it was the largest uh, male prostitution ring in the city that they've ever ever had uncovered. It was a million dollars a year minimum. Yeah. And yet they only prosecuted the operator, uh, Henry Vinson, and three of his lieutenants, as it were. Mm -hmm. They never went after any of the Johns or the clients. This operation, which was, again, quite large, claimed to have clients that ran from the White House to the Capitol Hill to the State House to the churches to, in, within the media. Um, and that's and precisely of, what Paul describes as the people he was with. And a lot of the stuff led there, but we couldn't quite nail it at all cases because, again, to accuse someone of high yeah. stature, you've got to be very careful. I understand. We were able to do it through the, uh, the mother load, which provided us credit card receipts and canceled checks, and then um, lists of the clients. The prosecutors knew all this stuff. There was approximately 20,000 pieces of doc or 20,000 documents yes. that they had. They sealed the entire record when they found out I was accessing it. They required consent agreements from all the lawyers, all the clients, all the relatives of all the clients, all the hookers, 
including the clients themselves. Which means you can never gain access. They steal them by court order. And we have tried, to, we've attempted on several occasions to unseal that, and we've been told it will be a cold day in hell before those records ever get unsealed. And it makes me wonder what's in those records. Yeah. The Attorney General is now involved. Bill Colby has passed the camp's evidence to a senior lawyer in the Justice Department. He did say that the Attorney General's office would be very sensitive to any charges of abuse of children, that this was a matter of considerable priority to the department, that this sort of thing not take place, and that they would assign an officer to look into the case. For John DeCamp, the story of Larry King's corrupt empire holds a dire warning for America. If you can control about three or four key elements, you can totally own a state, you can make right wrong, you can make truth falsehood, falsehood truth. If you control the media, if you control the Justice Department, if you control the police, you own the system. It's beyond belief that arguably the most powerful person in the world, the President of the United States, in the form of Richard Nixon, could not prevent the investigation of Watergate, or that President Reagan could not prevent the investigation of Iran-Contra, and yet somehow this group of unnamed, unknown, anonymous individuals in Omaha, Nebraska have such power they can control and protect all of these people from being investigated. Those allegations are ridiculous. Well, first of all, Nixon did cover up Watergate, number one. Bush did cover up Iran-Contra, at least officially. And Omaha has successfully covered up this situation. In each case, it was the press that exposed the problem. It wasn't institutions of government. They had been corrupted. They had been compromised. They were the ones doing the cover-up. The Justice Department, acting through FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Omaha, emerges from the record of the Franklin investigation, not so much as a party to the cover-up, but as its coordinator. Rigging grand juries, harassment of witnesses, incitement to perjury, and tampering with evidence, federal personnel were seen to apply all those techniques in the Franklin case.